Okay, as I mentioned, I, I entitled this The Land Northward and um, introduced uh, concepts about the ancient artifacts found in Michigan and explore how they are relevant to uh, the Book of Mormon and uh, other things that we have researched. So um, I'm just going to get into this. Like I say, this is a kind of abbreviated version of a, of a much longer discussion, but I think we can cover the, uh, the main points here. Now, first of all, I, the Book of Mormon, as you know, was translated by Joseph Smith by the power and uh, gift of, of, from God. And if the Book of Mormon is a real record, which it is, then it ought to be, there ought to be physical evidences that it actually happened somewhere. And there is. And there seems to be an apparent lack of evidence that where the Book of Mormon took place. And because of that, a lot of people think, well, it's just, it's a fiction. It didn't take place anyway. And uh, with, with, including with some people thinking that it took place in, uh, you know, with Central America and so on and so forth, but they struggle having a connection between the things that they see in Central America and the things that we in the Book of Mormon. I know I did. There is, I have another video called um, The Nephites Lived Where, and which I explore how sort of my history of how I thought a particular way and then got more evidences and found the heartland model. And so we're going to look at some of these things and uh, kind of explore them. Okay, so Joseph Smith, the prophet. I had heard Brother Callus say once that when Joseph Smith received the plates, he got down on his knees before the Lord and said, Oh God, what will the world say? And the voice of the Lord came to him, Fear not, I will cause the earth to testify the, the truth of these things. In other words, the Book of Mormon and the events that happened. So keeping that in mind, there is, I have feel, a really strong correlation between the Book of Mormon the Smithsonian surveys, and you know about that? Who has heard about the Smithsonian surveys? Okay, and uh, and the Michigan artifacts, um, obviously found in Michigan, and not only in Michigan. There's other artifacts scattered around, but the Michigan artifacts have the greatest abundance, ten thousands more than that of artifacts, and that can be a discussion for another time. But um, uh, look here. Oh yeah. I was supposed to click on this. Book of Mormon. Okay, we're going to start with the Michigan artifacts. Now, as I said, the Michigan artifacts was there is an enormous collection of, of slate, copper, clay uh, artifacts, plates, and all, all kinds of other things. And they were found in 27 different counties in Michigan from about 1812 to 1919. And that's the period of time when all the settlers were coming, you know, west from the East Coast and finding these things all over the place. And um, a lot of them were just like in the fields when they would plow through and they go, oh, what's this? They'd find some sort of copper item, melt it down and use it. <laughs> and other things they found were slates and stuff. They found pipes, they found jewelry, they found um, even coins uh, and lots and lots of things. Here's some pictures of, of items that I don't think exist anymore. Um, these, this is a picture here of, of all kinds of artifacts that were um, photographed, and this is about 100 years ago that this picture was taken. But the problem is that the experts say oh, these are all fakes. This couldn't possibly be anybody here before Columbus. Couldn't be possibly be anybody that had this sort of a skill and knowledge, both in language and artistic skills and so on and so forth, but so they're fakes. And so when people found out that they were fakes, well, they threw them out. And so these are all gone. Um, here is a um, sampling of some of the uh, artifacts that are on, on slates. And these slates, they're etched into them. And so they kind of survived real well. This is a cool one. This is a sundial and um, other plates. I have made uh, replicas of these plates, including these, because they're so interesting. And, I, and it's, I wanted to buy some of these plates for myself but you can't get them, they're too expensive even if you were to find one. So I just did the next best thing is I made replicas. And so these are exact replicas. Um, here are, this picture of a clay box. In fact, here's another clay box and a slate box. 
Now the clay box is is all broken up in pieces, and this second one here in the middle is is gone. Nobody knows what happened to it. And this one on the end is still in existence. It was a man had found this while digging a uh, basement uh, for his house on on the shore of Lake St. Clair. Found this, found that sundial, found a bunch of other things. So these things are scattered all over the place. And here are some examples. Just one example of of copper. Uh, also copper and uh, clay pipes. Boy, they had a lot of clay pipes with little faces on them or animals and things like that. They're just all over the place. And coins. And of course, thousands and thousands and thousands of arrowheads. Now, here is an interesting plate here. This, and there's several of these. And so here's just, I think, two or three of these. So here's a slate. And it shows two opposing armies, this army here and that one there. And this army here is dressed in uh, robes and they have uh, helmets on, they're carrying spears and, and arrows or something in their arms here. And this one over here, they are barely dressed. They have like loincloths on and they have headdresses on their, on their head. And can't really see it, but there's some other examples where they have like a shaved head. And so here, when we read this, so, and when the armies of the Lamanites saw that the people of Nephi, or that Moroni, had prepared his people with breastplates and with arm shields, and also with shields to defend their heads, and also they were dressed with thick clothing. Now, the army of Zarahemla was not prepared with any such thing. They had the swords, bows and arrows, stones and slings, and they were naked save it were for a, a skin around their, about their loins. And here you see this opposing armies here, and they're dressed very differently from each other. If anybody knows anything about some of these uh, plates, uh, so uh, for instance, the mystic symbol and various other things, there is a uh, marking right here, which means these are the good guys. And it's the same thing with several of the plates. Let's go on to another one. This one's really nice. Again, it shows the army and they're very different, okay? And so this is just a sampling of some of these plates and there's, um, because it correlates really well with the Book of Mormon about the Levites and Lamanites being different, dr differently dressed and opposing each other and so on. And here's an interesting thing I thought was kind of fun is that a lot of the Michigan plates, the collections show uh, figures, people dressed and there's so many of them that are very interestingly um, dressed. They are so ornate. And for fun, I decided to kind of color these things in to just kind of maybe give an inkling of what these things might have looked like then as the artist is looking at whatever he's drawing and trying to, and it's only in black and white. So he's trying his best to interpret what he's seeing. And so these look pretty ornate. And it came to pass in the eighth year of the reign of judges that the people of the church began to wax proud. And, and in all their things, they were lifted up in the pride of their eyes, so they began to wear very costly apparel. So let's move on to, real quickly, to the Book of Mormon. Lands of the Book of Mormon. Now, how many here are familiar with the Heartland model? Okay, good, excellent. So you probably know about this particular slide where it starts with the uh, Lamanites and the Nephites starting, well, Lehi's family starting at the bottom of North America where the landing was, moving up to the, what was called the land of Nephi. And they lived there for many hundreds of years. And then they split from the Lamanites, well, they split from the Lamanites down here, but they lived in the land of, Nephi and escaped uh, into the land of Zarahemla. And then the Lamanites took over the land of Nephi. And then later on, they moved to the land of Bountiful. And the gray area above is the land of desolation. And we're going to talk about that. That is actually the land northward. Okay, so here is the differences between north and south and in between. The, here is a map drawn in uh, 1894, and all the little red dots 
are uh, Indian burial mounds, big mounds, Indian burial mounds. And there's over thousands of these things on this particular map. And you can see where they were, um, whoops, let me go back. You can see that they were concentrated all around the riverways and uh, everywhere in the uh, Ohio Valley, Mississippi Valley, and so on and so forth, and also up into Michigan in this area here, and also uh, eventually in New York and, and so on. Okay. Now here is a close-up of the bottom of, of Michigan between Lake Michigan and Lake um, Ontario. Is it Ontario? Yeah, it's Lake Ontario. Erie. Oh, Erie, I'm sorry, Lake Erie. And so you can, this is how it is currently. Now, 2,000 years ago, and even all the way up to the 19th century, there was a great black swamp right here um, that extended the lake all the way down to Fort Wayne. It's called the Great Black Swamp. And it was later drained, and of course now it's just regular land. And there was also another swamp in this area here. So looking at the elevations, again, here's a picture with the all the little Indian burial mounds everywhere. And so I had outlined, well, here is the width of current Michigan. And then I had outlined the low levels of both, both lakes. And those how they kind of go in between and around all those various Indian burial mounds. And so a couple thousand years ago, this whole area was underwater, which accounts for why there's no burial mounds right there. And then because of that, and all the rivers were higher too, much higher than they are today. And because of that, the um, width of the very bottom of Michigan, in fact, a little further down into Ohio, is much smaller, much smaller. Now, I want to talk a little bit about, we'll leave that for a second. I want to talk a little bit about uh, north and south. Where is north and south? And there's several scriptures that very plainly say in the Book of Mormon what's north and what's south. And there is an area between the north and the south that is called, referred to as the um, Narrow Pass. Okay. So we're going to explore that. It came, it came to pass in the 30th and 7th year of the reign of the judges, there was a large company of men, even to the amount of 5,400 men, with their wives and their children, departed out of the land southward and went into the land which was northward. Okay, hanging on that for a minute. We have Zarahemla here, Bountiful over there. This every whole area in orange is the land southward. And it came to pass in the 40 and 6th year, there was much contention and many discussion, uh, dissensions. And a great many who departed out of the land of Zarahemla, down here, went into the land northward to inherit the land. And they did travel to an exceedingly great distance, um, insomuch that there came to large bodies of water and many rivers. Here's another and it came to pass that many of the Lamites did go into the land northward. And also Nephi and Lehi went into the land northward to preach the gospel. And after many years, um, the uh, <coughs> Nephi, the son of Helaman, returned to the land Zarahemla from the land northward. For he had been forth among the people who were in the land northward and had preached the gospel the word of God unto them. And, and also the land which was appointed unto the land was the land of Zarahemla, and the land which was between the land Zarahemla, which is down here, uh, and the land Bountiful, and the land Desolation. And there was a great many thousand people who went up into that land. So this whole area here separated from the land northward. And they came, this is Moroni, I mean Mormon. And it came to pass that I, being 11 years old, was carried by my father into the land southward. And so now we know that Zarahemla is in the land southward, okay? Now, by the way, the Nephites were here, the Lamanites were down below. 
in what was used to be called by them the land of Nephi. And so uh, they had to abandon that area. Okay, and this is where we're finding the majority of all those Indian mounds, the plates, the, uh, uh, the artifacts, and everything was in these areas here. Now, that discussion was to show where was the difference between the, where was the land northward, where was the land southward. Now we're going to focus in on the narrow neck. Some people, researchers or others, think that there is a narrow neck, there's a narrow pass, there's a narrow passage. And if you look at the scriptures really carefully, you see that it's all the same spot. They, sometimes they call it a pass, sometimes, sometimes they call it a passage, <laughs> and sometimes they call it a neck. But it all describes the same spot, going from the land southward up into the land northward. Most of the time, there wasn't anybody in the land northward. Do you know why? It was called desolation. Too cold? No, no. Anybody know? Why was it called land of desolation? Lumber. There was no lumber. There was no lumber. Nobody wanted to go up there. Later on, they did go up there, <coughs> and they had they uh, they brought lumber up by way of shipping. Um, from the south up into the north, so they could build some things. They built many uh, cement houses. Yep. So let's look at this one here. This is in chronological order for the very first time we hear about the narrow neck. <laughs> Excuse me. It says the Jaredites built a great city by the narrow neck of land, a great city right down there by the place where the sea divides the land. That's always been kind of a weird thing because normally the land divides the sea, but this is where the seas divide the land. This is, these are the seas that they're talking about. And it came to pass they did not head them, uh, the army that was trying to chase them, the Nephites, until they had come to the borders of the land desolation. And there they did head them by the narrow pass, which led by the sea into the land northward. Yea, by the sea on the west and the sea on the east. And the next one. And he sent orders unto him that he should fortify the land bountiful, which is down here in the land southward, uh, and secure the narrow pass which led into the land northward. So there was an area there that they could separate the two lands, north and south. It wasn't all one big land. And that way they could as they say, fortify the area. And it came to pass that Hagoth built him an exceedingly large ship on the borders of the land bountiful, in orange there, by the land desolation up there in green, and launched it forth into the West Sea, which is Lake Michigan, by the narrow neck, which led into the land northward. And there he goes, somewhere. Next one, and the Lamanites did give unto us. Now, this is when the when the Lamanites were chasing the Nephites. This is like the final battles. The Lamanites did give unto us the land northward. So now they're up in the land of desolation, the land northward. And um, to the narrow passage, which led into the land southward. And uh, the Lamanites did, and we gave into the Lamanites all the land southward. So at this point in time, the Nephites had completely left their homeland. You know, they had left the land of Nephi. Now they've left the land of Bountiful and Zarahemla, and everybody was up into the land of desolation um, through that narrow neck of land, running away from the uh, Lamanites. And you see this is uh, about 350 AD. Okay, and it came to pass that I did cause my people that they should gather themselves together at the land desolation to a city. Remember that city? To a city which was in the borders by the narrow pass, which led into the land southward. So just two references to it. It's also called the city of Desol or city desolation. Other times it's just simply called the city. But on both instances, it's described being by the sea, by the narrow neck, which led from the land southward into the land northward. So now what do we got there? 
So remember, I was showing you the uh, the black arrowheads that uh, the distance between the two lakes. Well, here it is in close up. And if when you read the scriptures about um, the narrow neck, it says that it's a a day and a half from the West Sea to the East Sea. Now, some people think that the day and a half is the distance of the narrow neck, but that's not what it says. It says that is the distance of a day and a half from the east to the West Sea. It's not the size of the narrow neck. It's the distance between the two seas. And so what I've got outlined there with the big black arrow is only about um, a little bit more than 20 miles, maybe 30 miles. And so that would be like a day. And sometimes they refer to it as a day and a half for a Nephite, whatever that means. Um, I guess they run faster or slower or something than the Lamanites. Never can figure that one out. And here's the other one. And there they did fortify against the Lamanites from the sea, from the West Sea, even unto the east, being a day's journey for a Nephite on the line which has fortified and stationed their armies to defend their north country. Now, somewhere within this area is some sort of higher ground, whether it's here, maybe over here, somewhere. Somewhere there is a higher ground that can't be very wide because they, they fortified against it. If it was 50 miles wide, 100 miles wide, how would you fortify that? You can't. It has to be something that's really kind of narrow. And so maybe the rest of this area whether it was the swamp or lake, would be really hard to travel through, especially if it was swampy. And so, but there was something sticking up here that they referred to as the narrow pass, how they could get from the land southward up into the land northward. So we're going to jump ahead to the last of the uh, Nephite history where they're escaping from the Lamanites and they went from the land southward up into the land northward. We're going to pick that up. And so Zarahemla, Moroni, and Moroni, uh, Moronihah were all located in the, in the land southward. Now in the scriptures, there was the big earthquake, right? And so uh, Mormon uh, talks about the destruction in the land northward and also in the land southward. But he starts with the land southward. And he says, this is all land southward. And the city of Zarahemla did take fire. Where is Zarahemla? It's in land southward. And the city of Moroni did sink the depths of the sea, and the inhabitants were there were drowned, also in the land southward. And the earth was carried up upon the city of uh, Moronaiha, um, and then in the place of the city became a great mountain. So this is the things that happened in the land southward. And then he says, but there was a greater destruction in the land northward. It says, for behold, there was a great and terrible destruction in the land northward. Now, a lot of times when I would be reading the scriptures, I'm thinking, oh, okay, so the land northward is where the Nephites live, and the land southward is, I don't know, where the Lamanites live. No, the Lamanites were in the land of Nephi. And, and Mormon, when he writes about this, he doesn't say anything about the land of Nephi. For what the Lamanites uh, uh, experienced, he talks about his land, which is the land southward and the land northward. And so there's a great and terrible destruction. The whole face of the land was changed because of the tempests and the whirlwinds and the thunderings and the lightnings and the exceedingly great quakes. And the highways were broken up and level roads were spoiled and smooth and many smooth places became rough. And many great and noble, notable cities were sunk, and many were burned, and they were, uh, and many were shaken till the buildings thereof had fallen to the earth, and the inhabitants thereof were slain, and their places were left desolate again. Right now, it's back to kind of a land of desolation. They built it all up; it all came falling down. Now we're going to talk about. The Smithsonian surveys. Now, this was way back in 1846 that a, a crew of uh, a team and their uh, crew ha had been sent by the Smithsonian to survey all the various Indian mountains and things that were in uh, the Mississippi Valley, Ohio Valley. Um, they didn't get to the deep south. They didn't get 
all the way to the uh, east, and it didn't go anywhere uh, west of the Mississippi because of all, you know, ferocious Indians there. And so, uh, but they made many, many surveys. This is Ephraim Squire and Edwin Hatch. And um, here are is a book that they produced. Um, it wasn't colored, but I colored them up. And so these are the areas, some of the many, many areas that they had found and, and recorded and, and scaled out and had all these various features of these uh, things. Now, these places were not built by the present day Indians. The Indians said, we didn't make these. They were here long before we came. So it was, it was the older Indians that made these, older people, ancient inhabitants of this land. And so this book contained 306 pages, 48 lithographs, and 207 illustrations, and was the first publication by the Smithsonian um, Institution. And then in 1848, um, Mr. Squire had gone over to the area of New York around Lake Ontario and had found all these structures, there's a whole bunch of them. And I'll show you those in just a minute. And these, along with the others, are just an incredible resource of what used to be there. They're all gone for the most part now. And uh, there's traces of some that you can find, uh, but for the most part, they're all gone. And there's three different categories, which I found that uh, of all these various things, one are these really large enclosures, areas of defense, Many of them had a ditch and a wall and, and uh, had very much barricaded and large. This is 148 acres with a pond in the middle. And then the other category were these. And these are really interesting. The, the Squire and Davis uh, dubbed these things as being sacred enclosures. There was no watchtowers. There was no uh, uh, defensive barriers. It was all the same. And every one of these was about a dozen or so. Um, were the same thing with a circle and a square and a smaller circle, but kind of rearranged a little bit. And that's in, in the book too. And then the third category is with these really small little ones. And these are what are around, what are around Lake Ontario. I'll show you those in a minute. And for scale, there's a size of football field. Okay, so you kind of get an idea of what we're talking about here. These are all drawn to scale. Now, we're going to get back to the escape of the Nephites from the Lamanites. Now, the, everything you see in yellow is the Lamanite country. And where they were exactly, not sure, but they were all down here and they have surrounded the Nephites for, for centuries. And then after Christ came and you know there was no war, then a couple hundred years later, war picked up again, right? And so this is where they were currently. So the orange is the land of Zarahemla and the land of, of uh, Bountiful. Now you notice it's separated by major rivers like the Mississippi and the Illinois and the Tennessee River uh, because those are natural boundaries for any land. There was no marker that says, okay, from here to here is our land. It was mountain peaks and rivers. It was a natural boundary. Um, so anyway, they, and then the green is the land of desolation or the land northward. Now, in the Ohio Valley, there are many of these things, uh, of these uh, enclosures located uh, there in present day Ohio, Indiana, Illinois kind of area, well, not Illinois, but Ohio ish area. And they're large, very large enclosures. Now, Captain Moroni said, or Borman said, that it came to pass that Moroni, in other words, Captain Moroni, uh, caused his army should commence the digging up heaps of earth around all the cities, around all, throughout all the land which are possessed by the Nephites. And here are some of those surveys of, and this is, I think I'm gonna show you about three of these things, but there's many dozens of these things where it has a wall and a ditch surrounding their city or enclosure. And I colored the wall green and the ditch red. And you can see at the very top, there's a sort of a profile of the green and the red green, red, two, two walls here, and cross sections of some of these walls, but they are unique. Here is the scripture that says the Lamanites could, get not, could not get into the forts of security because of the highness of the bank which had been thrown up and the depth of the ditch which had uh, been dug round about. 
Here's another one. Now we have a natural defense around here, and this is this is the level of the river around these areas in 1846, but thousands of years ago, it, the level was higher. So it would have been expanded quite a bit. So they had a natural defense around here, but then they added this ditch in the wall in front so they could um, support their enemies. And then you have a little tiny entrance where it says gateway. That's how you got in. Here's another one here. Notice the, uh, the place of entrance here, kind of like a gauntlet or something. And then here's a blow up right here. And here's a cross section here, and then down and up. Now, when they surveyed these things, they had been, this is after hundreds of years of erosion. So the ditch would have been lower and the, and the uh, wall would have been higher. Um, but, you know, after erosion, that's, that's all that's left. And it says that they put these things around every city uh, in all the land. Here's another interesting one here. Now, this one doesn't have a ditch and a wall, but it has a very interesting place of entrance. When you come through your opposing army is here, he's got to squeeze around this wall and he's got to run in here and he has to, doesn't know which way to go. He comes around over here and oh, okay, he gets in, maybe around over here and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, everybody's throwing stones and arrows and things at them, right? To try to keep them out. And then there's also it's escape areas here and here and here that if they really needed to, they could jump out, probably get in their boats and, and uh, protect themselves. And it says, that the Lamanites brought up their armies before, in other words, in front of the place of entrance, and, um, and began to contend with the Nephites to get into their places of security. But behold, they were driven back. Here's an, another scripture here. Again, this is now after the uh, years of peace with, Neph with uh, after Christ had come, that they began to have war again. And they had serious battles. And in Mormon, he writes, the Lamanites to give unto us, remember this, the, all the land northward and even to the narrow pass or passage, which led into the land southward. And we did give unto all the Lamanites, all the land southward. And then, so now they're up here and they are running. They are running, and, and if they don't run fast enough, the Lamanites are just going to cut them down. And again, talking about the narrow passage, and we do give them the, all the land southward. And here it says, and it came to pass that the Lamanites did come down against the city of Desolation, which is down there at the very bottom, and there was an exceedingly sore battle uh, in which they did beat the Nephites. And it came to pass the Nephites did again flee before them, taking all the inhabitants with them, both in towns and villages. Now, you look at the map, there's only one way to go. You can't go south, you can't go west, you can't go north, you kind of can for a little while, but you're, you're trapped. There's only one way out, and that is to the east. And it came to pass that whatsoever lands that had uh, we had passed, in other words, the Nephi army had went by, uh, the inhabitants thereof were, and if the inhabitants of there were not gathered in, they were destroyed by the Lamanites. And their towns and their villages and their cities were burned with fire, and thus 370 and nine years had passed away. Now, some critics of the Heartland thing says, well, where are, where are the buildings? You know, where, where are the relics? I don't see anything. They were burned. And why? Because they were all made of timber. And I don't know if I have this on here or not on this particular presentation, but Nephi says that um, they built all their buildings out of timber. Um, their temples and their synagogues and their churches and their houses and everything was built out of wood. And um, so Nephites burned them all, I mean, Lamanites burned them all down. So they're fleeing. And I, Mormon, having been commanded of the Lord that I should suffer, uh, should, should not suffer the records which have been handed down by our fathers, which were sacred, to fall into the hands of the Lamanites, for the Lamanites would destroy them, like everything else. So they pushed eastward. And it came to pass that we did again take to flight. And those who flight was swifter than the Lamanites 
did escape, and those whose flight did not exceed the Lamanites were swept down and destroyed. And look where they're heading. Does anybody see where they're heading? Mora. And I, Mormon, wrote an epistle unto the king of the Lamanites and desired of him that he would grant unto us that we might gather together our people unto the land of Camorra and by a hill which was called Camorra, and there we would give them battle. So here is Camorra. The little red uh, pin you see there, that is the hill Camorra, and this is Lake Ontario. Okay, so they came this way and ended up there. So, Hill Camorra, and we did pitch our tents around the Hill Camorra. And it was a land of many waters, rivers, and fountains. Um, and we hoped to gain advantage over the Lamanites there. All of these red pins here are where these New York surveys were. And look where they are. They're all around Camorra. And here's what some, he said, we've gathered our remainder around the people of the land of Camorra. And here's what some of those look like. And they're small, but they have the same thing where they have a ditch and a wall, ditch and a wall, ditch and a wall, uh, usually backed up against some natural re uh, structure that don't have to do with ditching a wall around a whole thing, but maybe just around a certain area. And these are them, and they're very small. Are these the encampments that the Nephites uh, built so they could, you know, live again the next day and do more battle and stuff? And as they were gathering all their people, maybe so. Hill Camorra. And he, the uh, Mormon, was commanded to uh, put all the records that he had been entrusted with into the Hill Camorra, all the plates, everything was in the hill Camorra. Behold, I, Mormon, do finish the record of my father, Moroni, do finish the record of my father, Mormon. Therefore, I will write and hide up the records in the earth. So that's where the hill Camorra is. So in this presentation, is there a connection between the Book of Mormon and the, and the surveys and the Michigan artifact? I think so. I think there's a strong connection and stronger than anywhere else. Um, we know that the Book of Mormon happened in the Great Lakes area, and all that Mississippi Valley, Ohio Valley, everywhere you saw all the little red dots, those are both Lamanites and Nephites uh, villages and, and so on that was found. Mm -hmm.